the very first day people think you're going to be afraid and it's actually a sense of relief when you leave the, the dock you've been wanting that for months and months and there's like a stress build up so the moment i left and obviously there's a moment where it's sad you leave all the loved one behind and you have all these uncertainty but there's really a sense of adventure a sense of okay now it's me in the ocean i love it that's what i want to do and feel of uh, your joy and happiness there are so many lessons i got to tell you on that failure uh, people don't like to to call it failure because you know you say there's no failure it's just you know learning opportunities but i think actually we shouldn't be afraid of the word yes i failed i didn't cross but why and that's in the answering the why that actually you learn the most and one of the things is i realized that So when I speak to a school or you know like, like here in California 900 kids from 12 to 14 imagine if I just put a little seed of adventure in their heart at 14 what they will do in 10 years I love this Welcome to another episode of the Adventure Diaries Today I'm joined by Cyril Derimo Cyril is a world record breaking adventure kayaker whose feats include the Great Pacific Race the Yukon race and his daring solo kayak across the Pacific Ocean from the USA to Hawaii. Now Cyril is a French native but now resides on the west coast of the USA and he's transitioned from the wine industry to becoming a full-time adventurer and motivational speaker. Cyril's story is not just about physical endurance but also about mental resilience too. And today he shares his insights from these voyages, the harrowing storms, the failed first attempts, and we discuss the highs and the lows and what it truly takes to endure in such formidable challenges. And we touch on his preparation for another upcoming and epic kayaking adventure, the Atlantic Crossing. So settle in and enjoy this fantastic conversation with Cyril Derimo. Cyril Derimo, welcome to the Adventure Diaries. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. How are you, my brother? I'm excellent. I'm excellent. I'm very excited about this. Uh, taking a little bit of time to get organised. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for your patience. Uh, and what I want to really focus this session on is is your uh, your epic paddling adventures to date, and an even more epic adventure that that awaits uh, next next year. So. A bit of a brief introduction without uh, going too deep on it. You, you mean you are an adventurer, a bit of an, an ultra endurance adventurer, really considering the the expeditions that you've been on, and you're you're actually a world record holder, aren't you? So you 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 have broken some records as recognised by the Guinness Book of Records for your uh, Great Pacific race and your solo kayaking from California to Hawaii, but. I want to kind of roll back a little bit and understand more about your background because you are a French native, but you reside in the West Coast of America. So how did that come to be? Well, okay, so I'm 47 years old. And until I was 18, I lived in France. You know, I did my regular studies up, up to baccalauréat, which is the 12th grade before college. And I call these 18 years my roots. I was so lucky to be in a very strong family household in a small village and have, you know, just the, the really, really good childhood. So after the, I grew those roots, I found my wings. And my wings is what is carrying me to new adventures all the time. And from the moment, so I 18, I, I left an, as an exchange student before I did, you know, a college or university. I did one year in Arkansas <laughs> in the U.S., And because I was, you know, I wanted to live overseas, learn a new language. And I loved this. So I came back and said, I'm going to do an, an international studies. And I did this master's degree in international business, which took me a year in Oxford in year, England, a year in Madrid, Spain, and then a year in Paris. And then I moved to going to Italy for two years because I wanted to learn Italian after Spanish and English. Um, and I, after Madrid, uh, Milan, sorry, for two years. I had the project of going, like everybody had their diploma. They started to work in banks and stuff. For me, I had the the need to see the world. I didn't care about money. I didn't care about, you know, having my first car. And I, it's, so I saved a little bit of money and for 7,000 euros, I did one year trip around the world backpacking. 
visiting the whole world, like all South America, North America, Southeast Asia, and a little bit of, you know, India, because it's such a big country. And, and then after that, I said, okay, I'm in love with Brazil. And I found a job as teaching English and playing soccer in Brazil. So I went to Brazil for six months. I learned Portuguese. And after that, you know, it was back to France. Okay, now, now I need to find a job. <laughs> so I was in France for a year, but then I was recruited to move to Argentina for two years. And that's when I opened the subsidiary for a barrel company, you know, French, mm -hmm. uh, French oak is really good for oak aging. So I went to Argentina for two years and that's how I got into the wine business. Long story short, after Argentina, I was sent by another company to California to take care of the subsidiary in the wine business. So I was for maybe 10 years in the wine business um, in, here in California, and I'm still here now. Yeah, ph phenomenal. H h so going from, the, so how, how did you transition from the wine industry to being almost like a full-time adventurer and a motivational speaker? Because I think mm -hmm. the, the, you only, have you only been paddling like 10 years, under 10 years, or how long have you been yeah. paddling for? So my sport was always uh, football or soccer, like yeah. they say here in the US, right? Uh, imagine, look at, look at the countries I've been to, Argentina, yeah. Brazil, Italy, Spain, England, like everywhere I go, I play soccer, football, and it's fine. I can make friends right away. And I moved to the US and I played here, but I didn't really like the spirit. It was not the yeah. same as Brazil, where it's all like Jogo Bonito. And all. So a friend of mine said, hey, why don't you come paddling? I'd never kayaked before. I'd done some windsurfing when I was younger because I used to go in Brittany, French Brittany mm -hmm. in, the, in the summer. So I did windsurfing, but kayaking, no. I was 32 years old when I started kayaking for the first time. And when I was 42, which is only 10 years after the first moment I put my butt in a kayak, then I dared myself to cross solo and unsupported, which is kind of mind blowing. Can you believe in 10 years? Yes, that's crazy. So... Then the journey was, I think it's a very much, a, I think the spirit of this country and this state here where really there's this energy where they say, you want to go for it? I mean, go mm. for it. And the friends around you are this energy of entrepreneurship. And it, why not? You want to do this? Why don't you do that? And that really combined with my personality of looking for experiences of life, looking for the next thing that would make me vibrate, yeah. you know, just worked like perfect. And I grew, I felt so great here. That little by little, I started to do more and more adventures on the water. So kayaking, first it was canoeing, mm -hmm. and then kayaking, rowing, and then and more kayaking. Yeah, I was going to say, so have you always been around the West Coast in the Bay Area then when you've been doing your paddling, or have you done that further throughout the U.S.? Yeah, the paddling was mostly on the West Coast where I live. Mm -hmm. Um just because there's so much to do here. And then I've been, I've done a few races, uh, other races, but uh, only lately in, in Texas, I've done other races in Canada. Um, but I'm just reminding myself that I actually didn't answer your previous question of how did I move from the wine business to doing an adventure? So the wine business, I was, it was my passion. Yeah. I like products that are qualitative. Mm -hmm. You know, I was making, helping making barrels back in Argentina. And I, I really like to, you know, learn about winemaking, wine tasting. And my, part of my job was actually to taste wine. Oh. So I loved it. Yeah. I did that for 10 years. You know, I was a supplier for the wine business. So I was visiting wineries and tasting with the winemakers. But it's it's funny how, you know, your priorities change. And then after just doing that as a job made it less interesting. And I was, mm. okay, at the, after 10 years, I thought, okay, I need to change. And then COVID happened. I created my own company. And then for a year, I actually, it was a, an opportunity of a lifetime. I started to import furniture and I did, did a lot of that. And then after a year, COVID happened, you know, the, the container shipped and we were super expensive. So it, it stopped. But then I said, okay, well, everything's blocked. I'm going to be an adventurer full time. <sighs> and <laughs> it's, uh, I, 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 yeah, I decided to build this kayak in England yeah. Uh, for for the crossing and that was a big challenge in itself just to to decide to do this i, I still remember seeing the a clip on instagram a couple of years ago a few years ago when you you were first planning this and i remember at that time thinking i'm going to speak to that guy because i hadn't long taken up kayaking not long before it did you uh, yeah myself i haven't done any sort of distances or anything as mad as, as what you have achieved, but uh, I only took it up about four four years ago. Uh, 
and d- done some really interesting in trips. But uh, so I wanted to ask: so how do you go from recreational paddling to taking on a challenge such as because you've done it as a team event, didn't you? First, your great uh, your great Pacific race, I think, thirty nine days, a speed race with four friends. Yeah. So first, I I started. Uh, it, it's it's a Polynesian canoe, so it's a six man craft, mm-hmm. you know. And then that's what they do in Hawaii, in Tahiti, and that's a national sport over there. And in those canoes, you do races up to maybe forty forty miles. You know, uh, I can say miles because you yeah. <laughs> you understand them. <laughs> so forty miles, it takes about six hours, and then I push a little bit the envelope, saying, "Okay, well, I, there's this race, a hundred miles. Okay, that's twelve hours. Let's do this. It's on a river in Sacramento." California. Okay. How about doing another one a little bit longer? The Yukon river quest. It's 440 miles. Okay. That's a different game. Cause that's 45 hours. You know, that's how do you prepare for that? And little by little, I just recognize that although I'm not very strong or I'm not very fast, I can keep going. Is there something about the, 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 the what you have to develop to be an ultra endurance that just matches with me where it's, it's, it's not mental strength. I like to say mental flexibility, where you allow you allow yourself to change your the, your framing of the situation so that it becomes bearable. Mm-hmm. And then, okay, you're hurting. Okay, how can you change that so you could keep going for the next ten hours, right? And then never give up, and then keep going on, and being positive, optimistic. And again, it was a conjunction of my personality and the fact that I just loved achieving a little bit more, a little bit more. So then it was. What you're talking about, which is a rowing shell, is like a rowing boat from California to Hawaii. I stumbled upon this website that it's a great Pacific race that say you don't have to be a rower to row an ocean. And until then, I had never rowed. I said, okay, well, if you, okay, well, of course you need to know how to row because there's a technique. If you do a thousand times, a million times, you know, there, you have to have the right muscle, the right technique. But his point was, it's really about your attitude and then how you manage the, all the other uh, in, uh, important things in the crossing, which is your hygiene, your sleep deprivation, your seasickness and eating and, and, and making sure, you know, your team building, et cetera. So I, we rode uh, from California to Hawaii and we went for the Guinness record. We got it in 39 days and 12 hours. The Guinness is always a chair on the top for me. And it never been a goal, never been a goal. It's cool to have because that then the sponsors say, okay, I'm going to sponsor you a little bit more, blah, blah, blah. And, and it, it's pretty cool to be on the book. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. other than that, I really don't, I, that's never been my motivation. For me, it's always been the adventure. And be, like just the thought of, of being out there on the ocean in the middle of the ocean, not seeing land for months was just very appealing to me. But as you said, I, I've always done it with team. And then I think part of the reason I wanted to do the kayak. So just to give you a, a rough idea, there's been 800 crossing and rowing boats over the history of ocean crossing all the oceans combined right 230 were solo more or less in kayak there had been four and, and the reason that there's been only four is because it's such a smaller vessel it has to be narrow because you have to kayak not with oars but mm-hmm. with kayak paddles right left right left right so you have to be able to touch the water on both sides at the same time. So it's narrow. It rocks and rolls all the time. The cabin is smaller. It's it's much more confined. So how do you carry that much food, et cetera, et cetera. So the difficulties are there. And there's no blueprint. And you have to be alone. And that was part of the appealing side of for me because I had done all those super achievements, but always with other people, yeah. right? And I'm an extrovert. I love people. I love it. Sh- like if I see a sunset... I can see it by myself. I enjoy it. But if I have a friend or, or, you know, it's so much better. I just enjoy team much more than being alone. So for me, I said, okay, well, maybe I did it all this because of the people who were here. Like, I want to see what would I do if I could do it by myself. Mm-hmm. And part of the challenge was also pushing my envelope, my pushing my boundaries, my, my comfort zone to see what I would do on my own. So, so, so how how do you so going back to your t- before we come to the the, the solo crossing then because I'm interested to know about because you talk about the mental flexibility but physically how do you prepare for something of that magnitude and that endurance do you do did you have a plan did you do, like 
you think about marathon runners and ultra distance runners, they, they run the miles, the kilometers, they build up to that. Did you do paddles? Because I, mean, I suppose the Yukon is a, is a fair, fair uh, challenge in, in its own right. Was that as part, was that pre Pacific race or was that post? Oh, uh, yes, it was pre. It was pre. in 2012, my first one. I did yeah. it three times. First on a six man canoe, then on a four man canoe, then on yeah. a two man canoe. Okay. Uh, so it's actually really hard to correlate one with another yeah. because if you think of it like the ultra endurance race of a hundred miles, well, that's going to be, you know, a day and a half, maybe max. So you're working like right now, we're talking about two months. Mm -hmm. So you can't, the, the, the issue you have to look at, okay, what are the possible problems that could happen physically, mentally, mm -hmm. emotionally, and then, you know, the gear, obviously. And then you say, okay, what do I mitigate each problem with another one, right? With a solution. And, and for me, physically, let's say, okay, how do I train for paddling 10 to 12 hours a day? Yeah. Uh, and you look, it's going to be, you're not rowing and paddling hard. It's like if you were walking 12 hours a day, every day, I'm not going to go hard. I'm actually never sweating. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the intensity that I'm going, but the problem could be repetition. What are the issues is not going to be muscular. If you have the right technique, it's not going to be, oh, I pulled a muscle. Yes, it could, but most likely it's going to be the joints and the tendons. Mm -hmm. Everything that is repetitive could be, you know, maybe I have a tennis elbow or like a problem with the, the nerves, yeah. right? So all this is, if you look back, okay, I need to be ready in one year for this. What are the, the, the tendons and the joints that are going to be used? Okay, I need to train those. And then the question is, how do I train that? All right? And for me, I've done... I did I kind of my own my own recipe. Uh, I just felt uh, if the body has to be just a very well old machine, anything that I do, I should not have any cramp. Yeah, and I should not get injured. So I need to be very healthy and, and not injured when I start because anything everything is going to hurt, right? Mm -hmm. But then how do you train? So if I only train kayaking, I might have an overuse injury, right? So. Uh, I just look at the body as a whole unit. So then I still need to work my lower limbs, you know, my legs and, and the core, et cetera, just even though I'm just paddling, rotating the, the shoulders. So for me, my training was long hours and, and then, you know, different months will have different uh, quantities, right? Obviously, but um, let's say I'm doing one hour of yoga, one hour year of running one day. And then the next day I'm going to do one hour of biking and one hour, one hour of kayak. The next day, I'll do two hours of one hour will be lifting weight and the other other hour will be another yoga or just you know jumping yeah. or even hiking for an hour. The idea is just to get to your, your body that is so well trained that I could do any kind of activity. I will never get, um, uh, you know, cramps or anything. Yeah. <clears throat> so you're essentially cycling and doing full body uh, weight and uh, yeah. Yes, it, this friend of mine in, uh, uh, who's another kayaker, he crossed the Tasman Sea, which is from Australia to New Zealand. His name is Scott Donaldson. He said, Cyril, look, I, and I could tell you the same, Chris. Chris, if I put you on a boat and I tell you, you have to paddle 12 hours a day or you're, you're dead. Like, mm -hmm. this is survival. You know, you could be overweight. You could be not trained. You're going to do it. This is, you have one way to go. It's there, right? So, so it's going to take what? 45 days or maybe a month for your body to adjust, but your body is amazing. He will adjust. So the holy thing, the only thing you want to do is by training, you want to reduce this one month of adaptation time to the shortest as possible, maybe two weeks, maybe one week, knowing that the first week is the hardest because you have the sleep deprivation, you have uh, mm -hmm. seasickness, uh, you have a you know, change of food, change, change of rhythm and change of environment. You don't sleep well, all these things, hygiene, all this. So um, there's only four guys that had done it before. How do you how do you know? <laughs> Just yeah. figure it out, you know. Yeah, okay. yeah. So on that with four people, how, how does that work in terms of? So firstly, sleeping conditions. So if you are, so were you all rotating like sleep every hour or two, or how, how did that work yeah. in a team of four? So team of four, um, we only had two rowing seats. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we want the boat to be moving all the time. So you rotate the people so that you're efficient for the time you're on the oars, right? And if you do more than two hours after that, like the two hours and a half, you're not pulling the oars as hard as you can. Mm -hmm. 
right? It'd be great for the people that are sleeping in the meantime, where you wake up and then your body could be aching. I think it's, uh, it's, it's generally known that one hour and a half or two hours is the rotation time. So yeah. you row for two hours, you stop two hours. You row two hours, you stop two hours, all day, all night. That means that when you're off, uh, we were doing an hour, hour and a half. You only sleep maximum 45 minutes, right? So uh, pretty much it goes like this. You get off the oar, uh, you have 15 minutes where you take off your clothes. Mm-hmm. Hygiene is crucial. So you remove all the salt from the ocean, from the, the water. And then another 15 minutes is eating. You need to eat right away, right? And then you have 45 minutes to sleep. You wake up and then you get ready for your next shift. So you get your clothes back, mm-hmm. you get your hands fixed, and then you're back rowing for two hours. Mm-hmm. That's that's really tough. I didn't like it yeah. at all. <laughs> How long did it take to get into that rhythm? Did it take you a few days or weeks before you kind of got yeah, adjusted it, to that? Yeah, I think it's the sleep. Uh, during the day, you're actually so sleepy that you, you fall asleep right away, or sometimes you don't have to sleep. But in, at night, it's really hard just to get up every two hours. And it doesn't matter if it's 2 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock. Yeah. you got to get up and change you know, your, your shift. Um, and then especially if you want to beat the record, uh, it's, it's seconds counts. <laughs> yeah. Let me give you a quick example. It's, okay, if you shift the two people every hour and a half, right? So that means you do a shift during the 12 hour of the day. You do eight shifts during the 12 hour of the night. Okay, that's 16 shifts. Now, if you take five minutes per shift, that means you come out and you can all oh, got to pee or put some sunscreen. I got to put my gloves, right? The boat is not moving for five minutes. All right, that means five minutes times eight is 40 minutes. Okay, that's about 12 hours a day. That's 80 minutes for the 24-hour period. 80 minutes, that's an hour 20 where the boat is not moving. An hour 20 times 70 days, that's 75 hours. 75 hours is three days. So now just by saying when we come out of the boat, we're ready to, sh- to shift, shift. You're going to the oars. No, you could shave three days off your final time, and that's how you get the record. You know, right. did that ever leave? Did that ever lead to any onboard conflict or com? <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course, we had four nationalities: a French guy, that was me. We had Carlo from the U.S. We have Fian from Iceland and Chago from Brazil. Uh, and it was it's actually so funny that you know Chago, we could never wake him up. Like we could never <laughs> wake him up. And when we left California, he was cold all the time. And we were like, okay, this is fine. When we arrived in Hawaii, it was the opposite. We were in the cabin. We were cooking. It was like, I'm just fine. This is good. You know? <laughs> wow. Wow. Are you all still friends? Uh, well, you know, what happens on the boat, staying on the boat. But I guess we'd say we, we, we managed to keep it together until yeah. the end of, uh, of the trip. Um, the people that w- worked were, with which it worked, their brother forever. Yeah. They're, they're, yeah, just. But the thing is, that, you know, it's really hard to find people that want to do this. So when you put a true crew together, mm-hmm. usually you don't. They're not your friends for for the since childhood. You know, they're, they're people that are in our case like from four different cultures and yeah. nationalities, and and the the people that you have on land uh, don't really correlate to the people that they could be on, on the water when you're sleep deprived and, and really hard, tired and all this. Uh, and it's okay. It's part of the trip to, to learn from it. And, and it's okay. So, so, so what did you learn then? Cause you said you would never do it again and then you'd done it solo. But yeah, well, I did it in very different conditions. Yeah. Um, I'm always wanted to do this for the adventure. I wanted mm-hmm. to feel what it is to be in the middle of the ocean. I wanted to feel what it is to row at night, etc. Um, and what put us on the same page with the others was the will to beat the record. So I did that. But for me, it was not natural. Uh, though I could see a bird. I was like looking at the bird and say, hey, stop and keep rowing. You know, stop stopping and keep rowing. So I didn't enjoy it because it's not matching my personality. When mm-hmm. I was alone, I was like, I don't care when I get there. I just want to get there. I don't stop as much as I need if I want to see a whale, if I want to see a turtle coming by or the flying fish or like it was so much more about the experience and just doing my own way. And, and I think that the most important is how you define success. What do you think that, that are the criteria of success for your adventure? And you only define it. 
Yeah, it's it's interesting you say that. I, I've had a, a few adventurers say something very similar, but in the context of their own adventures. And, and an example, one one chap, Ash Dykes, and he done a he done a cycle uh, throughout the UK, and it occurred to him that he was just whizzing past. He was on the clock, and he decided to do something very different and any long distance hikes, but taking the adventure in as you know without being on the clock, and it's. I think that mm. there is very much something in that, isn't it? Immersing yourself in, in the environment and the elements and sometimes the culture, depending on whether it's on land or not. So, Yeah, so it's funny. I've done this race up in Canada, the Yukon River Quest, three times. And I'm competitive. So whatever I do, I'm going to do my best, right? I'm going to find my best and, and push myself. Now, the third one, I was supposed to go with a friend who hurt his back. And you know, it's like six months of training. He hurt his back two weeks before going. So I was like, what? I can't cancel. I'm not going to go on a one man because I don't have the boat. We had organized and rented a boat. So I found this other friend and I said, Hey, you want to jump on the boat? Let's do that race. You know, it's 450 miles. So it's going to be 45, 50 hours. See, you crazy. I look, you want to race? No, no, no. Let's go for the adventure. We'll stop as many times as we need. And that's the race that I actually enjoyed the most. Because, yes, we took 15 minutes to stop by and make a little fire. And then, yeah, but we were still in the middle of the Yukon. At midnight, there's a sun that is, you know, still there. And I enjoyed it because there was not the pressure of performing. Yeah. Um, and that, that's when you say, okay, what are the factors of success? What, what does it mean? And on my crossing to Hawaii in the kayak, factor of success is stay alive, number one. <laughs> number two would be to cross and get there. And three is enjoy the journey. Yeah. And that was it. There's no time limit. There's no time pressure, you know, and, and I followed that. Yeah, it's, it's some achievement. I, first, I want to say congratulations and, and, you know, amazing job on the Great Pacific Race and the solo kayak. It's a phenomenal, two, two very, very great achievements. I want to ask about your kayak and the build, Valentine, I believe. It's named yes. after your sister. Yeah. Yeah. So how did that come about being okay. is it customed, custom created? Right. Well, I told you there are three people that had done it before me, right? I called them all. I, <laughs> there's <laughs> the first one is P Peter Bray. Peter Bray did a uh, crossing in the North Atlantic from Canada to Ireland in uh, 2001. I called him, I read his book and I said, Hey, would you like your boat? His boat has a cabin in the stern in the back. I said, yeah, I love my boat. It's self frightening. You know, I did it 76 days. Amazing. And two attempts. Then I called, called Scott Donaldson, Donaldson, who I told you about. He crossed the Tasman Sea, Australia to New Zealand. Took him three attempts. And he has a different boat, a little bit more slim, more kayak-like, less, less heavy. He wanted to be faster on the water. He had different arguments. His cabin was in the, in the bow. Spoke to him. And then I spoke also to Ed Gillette. Ed Gillette crossed. My, my ocean, <laughs> the, <laughs> the one from Canada, from um, California to Hawaii. It's the mid Pacific. It's not the whole Pacific. It's the mid Pacific, but he had a kite and I spoke to him. What did you think? Blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and there, the, the, actually the third one that did human powered is Alexander Doba. He's from Poland. He crossed three times the Atlantic. And I looked at everything online. He doesn't speak good English, only Polish. So I didn't speak to him, but in the end, I kind of made my point, like my argument, okay, what, what kind of boat do I want to build? You know, I want to take all the technology that I had on my first crossing, mm -hmm. but I want something safe. Like for me, I, uh, I'm not such a maverick that I, you know, I don't want to risk my life. I've got two kids. I want to enjoy <laughs> the rest of my, I just love adventure. So I wanted to have something. And the first criteria was safety. So Peter Bray said, you got to speak to this guy. His name is Rob Philo. He's in England. And speak to him, he built my boat 20 years ago. So I called Rob. Hey, Rob, are you going to build me a boat? Come on, <laughs> let's do this. And he said, Cyril, that was 20 years ago because that was in 2019. Wow. And he said, I'm retired. I don't have a shop. I don't know. I'm like, What are you talking about? And then we spoke a few times and I guess some must have been you know, enthusiastic enough that he felt my energy. And he said, okay, I'm going to build my last boat for you. So that's how it come about. And and there's not a lot of people that beat boats. Uh for crossing uh, oceans and I trusted Rob. So, um, he built my kayak. It took, uh, several months. Yeah. Uh, and, and her name, I named her Valentine for my sister. Right. Can I ask a favor? If you're enjoying the show, can you give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel on YouTube? 
And if you happen to be listening to the audio only version, can you give us a follow along there too? It'll really help grow the channel. We've got some fantastic guests coming up with some truly inspirational stories. Now, let's get back to this episode. Thank you. Uh, there's some great photos on your site uh, of the build as well, which uh, I'd recommend people have a, have a look at. What well, so so t- can you tell me about the cabin on that? Because it because obviously it's not it's not like a traditional kayak, you know, a recreational kayak, a touring kayak. It has a cabin. So so how how does that work? Because it must sit quite heavy in, in the water then. And and how when you go to sleep at night, you know how. Uh, how does it just I'm just curious about how does that work then because you're not at risk of capsizing are you or are you I don't Mm -hmm. really I don't really know much well the the boats that are built for ocean Uh uh, don't steer very well they're really heavy mine was fully loaded was 800 pounds so it's uh, like 400 kilos Uh right something like this with all the food, I had 220 pounds of food. Yeah. You have to be to be able to carry that much food because you're long term, term on the water without seeing any support whatsoever. Mm-hmm. My crossing, I wanted to do it solo, only on the boat. Unsupported, that means no boat that follows me yeah. or gives me anything from the moment I leave the pier to the moment I get to the next marina. And, and human powered. So then you say, okay, we're going to be three months on the water. You're going to have any kind of weather from a storm at 35, 40 knots of wind to uh, very flat water. How do we combine that in a boat that is safe? And and all these boats are self-rightening. That means if they do capsize, which could happen, they self-righten in the way they're built. First, the design. Mm. And secondly, the way they're, uh, you put the weight. So I, I put, I've got solar panels, so I've got batteries, two batteries. Those are heavy. So I put them under the water line. I've got a water maker because I can't carry that much water. I was drinking about a gallon, you know, three, four liters a day. So I would have to make my water. I have a water maker that's heavy. I put that under the water line. All my food is under the water line. And then that cabin is actually very important because if you close it and it's waterproof, then that means there's a big air pouch, right? Mm -hmm. So if I do capsize and I'm outside or inside, then it's just the air will come back naturally to the top. Now there's, uh, you don't want to get to a point where it capsizes. So you still, when we add sheets of lead at the bottom of the boat to add for uh, more stability, okay. more ballast. Uh, and then during the storm, you, you use what we call the sea anchor or a para anchor. It's a, like a parachute. And it's, it's a, at the end of the line, it's a big parachute that you put in that puts the boat perpendicular to the waves. So then the wave will ride, you know, you know across you. And it's kind of safe. It, it, it could happen that you have to stay for two or three days without moving. But if the hatch is closed, it's waterproof. You know, you just have mentally to be okay to, to wait it out. Yeah, that's great. Now, before you passed successfully, you did have an, a, an aborted attempt, didn't you? Was that, was that anything Correct. to do with the build on the kayak? Or was it something to do with your instruments? Well, it had to do... First of all, it was me uh, because I read, I don't know, I could see, I don't know if your people can see, but all these books are yeah. adventure books. Oh, I read all the people that have crossed oceans, all the people that have done it before, I've spoken to them. I actually did it myself, rowing, right? <clears> but <throat> a kayak is so different. It behaves differently on the water. And you can listen to all the podcasts, read all the books, talk to all the people until you have your butt in a storm you don't know what it is so i guess i thought i was ready and in hindsight hindsight i could see that uh i was overwhelmed by the situation i was in a condition where it was 35 knots of wind gusting 40 uh waves of 10 15 feet and i had to stay three days on the, my first attempt was in 2001 three days with you know attached to the chest and then the hips and just couldn't work for three days and night and didn't sleep at all at all um and at some point, my, my mind just said, okay, this is too dangerous. What happened is my sea anchor that was protecting me by putting my boat perpendicular to the waves collapsed. Uh, one of the, the lines that allows me to bring it back and collapse the Shit. parachute it got entangled in my rudder. Shit. So then it didn't do its work. The boat goes parallel to the waves. And then you're like, wow, okay. Yeah. Pounded, Christ. pounded. So, um, you know, there's option A, B, and C. 
And uh, with my lens support, we decided, okay, well, A would, would not be a good solution because it would be go out, you know, and dive and be attached to the boat, but dive and disentangle the hand, the, yeah. the rudder. But then I get hit by the boat and I pass out yeah. and I'm dead. Option number two would be to wait it out. I knew the storm would be another three days at least. And three days where I was really high stressed. Like I could see, like I was vomiting of stress, you know, that kind of level where I wanted to escape. And okay, three more days is just unbearable. I'm not, re- and, and that's when I said, okay, I wasn't ready yet. And third option is to call the Coast Guard and say, you know what? I did my attempt. It's not, it's not going to be for this year. The ocean will always be there. I can go back and train even better. So at the point, I thought it was, it was really just bad luck. So I Coast Guard came, picked me up with a helicopter, left the boat on the water. Three days later, I would be going with a tow boat and pick it up, and bring it back to land. Um, and then for that, after that, it was just a year of trying to understand how I could get prepared better. But like I said, Peter Bray took him two attempts to go. He got rescued the first time. Scott Donaldson took three attempts. Uh, it's it's just like when there's no blueprint. Yeah, it's really really tough to to have it right the first time. How did you feel after that? Did, did, did it get you down? Did you feel the chance had gone or were you just steely determined that you were just waiting to get back back on board? Um, a mix of this and that and this, that and the other. It's like at the first, you know, I felt like I was not given a fair shot and I want to do it again for sure. Should I go in two weeks? Should I go in a year? Um, and then I thought, look, I had actually done pretty good through the storm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then I had a conversation with Scott Donaldson and he said, Cyril, okay, well, do you think you were prepared? So yeah, I was prepared. The first three days were good. I did 30 miles a day. I was doing good. And, you know, I've at night I'm drifting, but I'm feeling good. You know, uh, uh, my equipment, I was, yeah, but you were rescued. So were you prepared? I said, yeah, but when I was rescued, that was because of the storm. That was because of the sea anchor. That is a malfunction. I'm lucky, but during the rescue, I had all the protocols. I had my, the right PFD, the survival suit, I had the flares, I had the communication with the Coast Guard. Yeah, but Cyril, you were rescued, so were you prepared? <laughs> and then I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> Excuse my French. Yeah. Okay, I wasn't prepared. Yeah. So he pushed me to the point where I had to admit that there was somewhere I was not prepared. So then it took a one year of ups and downs thinking, okay, well, you know, I'm letting my all the people that believed in me down. I, how could I do to being prepared again, but the dream was always there. The dream was like, I'm not giving a baby. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. I think I seen an inter- an interview with you. It was on some uh, American news channel or something. And you could just see that in your eyes. I think when you were getting asked the question, you could just see that I'm waiting to go again. I'm just waiting, I'm waiting to go again. This isn't, this isn't gone. This isn't given. I'm, I'm not giving up. It was good to see. Oh, there are so many lessons. I got to tell you on that failure. Um, people don't like to, to call it failure because, you know, you say there's no failure. It's just, you know, learning opportunities. But I think actually we shouldn't be afraid of the word. Yes, I failed. I didn't cross. But why? And that's in the answering the why mm. that actually you learn the most. And one of the things is I realized that I had communicated a lot about the, you know, I wanted to share my experience on social media, the press. and But when I took off the day I left, there were like TVs and stuff. And I felt I had succeeded. Like, and it's true because when you share, Hey guys, I'm leaving tomorrow. My boat is on the dock. I'm leaving. And then you get all these messages. This is great. Zero, we're behind you. So you get like a reward in some ways, like yeah. a gratification. But in the end, it's for something you haven't done. I haven't done anything. You know, I haven't left yet, but I felt like I had done something. So then I, I felt, okay, well, this is wrong. I shouldn't get any reward before I mm. actually do the thing, which is get to Hawaii. Right. So then I started to decide, okay. I'm going to do this one question and everything that I want to do for the next 12 months has, has to go through that filter, which is, is this what you're going to do? Going to increase the chance of success to get to Hawaii, right? So being on social media and doing a video, Hey guys, I'm preparing this. No, it's not helping. So I'm not doing this is, uh, having more press relationship. Of course I had the good intention, which is, Hey, I want eyeballs. I want to be in the media so that sponsors give me money for it so I can be able to do that, right? But no, it's not helping me. But what? Spending more time on the boat, doing training on the really bad weather, like actually getting a job. I changed job and I got a job as a diver when I was cleaning boats 
under under you know the allergy under the boats because I would get used to cold and being underwater. So then if I do have to disentangle my sea anchor from the rudder, then I can go and I feel safe. You know, it's like all the lessons that I've learned from that was so good. That's that's great. What what other what lessons? So rolling back a little bit in terms of like the mental side of things, and did you have a team to help you prepare for that the second time round? Because I have seen that you've got a bit of a team on your site, and I think it extends into like exercise, nutrition, but also a hypnotherapist. Uh, and I know you, uh, you're a you you're very much into visualization and stuff, aren't you as well? So how, how, did, that, mm-hmm. did that come together as part of your planning the second time round as well as just the physical and the the safety side? Mm-hmm. Well, I think you have to look at your strengths and weaknesses, right? And the strengths could be a weakness too. Like my strength is I'm very emotional, and when I get pumped up, like I can do it. Like yeah, it's, it's yeah, I put some energy and emotions in it. But it could be my weakness. Okay, so then you ask your question, well, how do I use that to my advantage? And then how do I pilot it if it's, I could see that it could be detrimental? In fact, for my crossing, maybe I cried every day. I always start to think of my friends and my, my mom. I start to cry. I love you, mom. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so the whole thing is for me, okay, the mental side, I'm going to try everything. I did Zazen meditation. Because I need to be able to cool down in a stress, stressful situation. I did hypnosis, did a lot of yoga. I did cold water soaking, you know, Beam, uh, Wim Hof. Yeah, yeah. Cold water. Yeah, I love this guy. And how do you do that in cold water and, and manage, you know, what you feel, what you think when you're in, in pain because of the cold? I did, I did have a coach, a mental coach, and he's a, a coach for the fireman. He, he does really super athletes yeah. level kind of stuff. And, um, for instance, um, one of the things was, okay, if I'm in the cabin, how do I get not stressed? And and he would say, Cyril, you got to get like whatever you fear or you think you can't manage, you have to go progressively towards that, right? And then you create automatism in, the, in your mind so that it becomes benign. For instance, you say, okay, well, the first time you drive, you drove your car. Remember the first time you were 18, what? Well, it's stressful because you have to change the gear, accelerate, brake, look at the mirror, look at the left, this guy's passing me. And then you do it so, it's so much time that it's just no problem, right? It's the same, you pass a lorry or truck that is in the rain for 10 seconds, you don't see anything. The first time you're like, what? And then, then you pass, it's okay for 10 seconds, I don't see, if I keep going straight, I'm okay. So he said, it's the same for you. If you have a wave that comes and swamps your cockpit, if it happens only once, so the first time you're going to be stressed, like what? Okay, I have to bail. I have to, you know, do this and that. And I, okay, if you do it 20 times, there's just a process. You say, oh, I got to start the bailing, do that. It's okay. Right? So the training will just in, go towards where you fear. And then another example is, okay, I don't, I don't know how I'm going to be in this little coffin of a cabin when it, on a storm. How do you get used to this? Right? It has to be a cocoon. You can't can't feel like you're trapped. How do you get there? Okay. Well, I built a box exactly the same size of the cabin and put it in my backyard <laughs> and I would spend the whole afternoon in it. Yeah. And then I would be with my computer because I could work, you oh. know, close enough that I got a Wi-Fi. And then my fiance would say, Cyril, you're crazy. You're 45 years old. And what are you, look what you're doing. That's commitment. <laughs> that's, that's real commitment. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. And then the boat arrives. It's on the trailer. I would sleep in the trailer. And then I put the boat on the water, on the dock. I would sleep on the dock like on the boat. And then I would put the boat on a buoy on a calm day in the middle of the bay and I would sleep it in. And then then on a stormy day, just progressively go towards what is hard to do. So that you know in the moment this happens, I just need to do A, B and C and just keep keep sticking to the process. Yeah. Fantastic. What was it like in the cabin at at night or or what was it like on the boat at night? Did you ever have any calm nights you could look at the stars and take it in? What, what was that mm-hmm. like? Yeah, I think it really only happens uh, the second half. So after maybe 40 days, uh, the first one, I was just so tired. You know, I would paddle all day from sunrise to sundown. Mm-hmm. And I would just be in, in, in the cabin. Uh, I feel like a cocoon. That was my safe place. Yeah. I, I close a hatch and then I'm just resting. And I was so, so tired. I would just pass out. But I still have to wake up every hour uh, because I've got a plotter, which is GPS, mm-hmm. right? And, <clears throat> 
can detect with a system called the AIS, Automatic Identification System, that sends my coordinates and my profile to other boats, and I see their boats, right? So I see there's a container ship 10 miles away, but the radius is maximum 20 miles, and they go 15 miles an hour, right? So that means if I have a radius of 20 miles and there's no boat in there, I'm okay for one hour. Yeah. So then I would sleep for an hour, wake up an hour, okay? Nothing on that. My radius of 20 miles, I can sleep another hour. So I would wake up every hour. Uh, and yeah, I would look at uh, my drift. Okay, I'm drifting the wrong direction. Uh, and I could lose up to five miles. Do 20 miles during the day, lose five, lose five at night. 20 miles, lose. It's like a shark teeth, you know? Yeah. Um, but it's always good to, to be reassured by knowing where you are. Yeah. But something <laughs> happened once, so scary. Um, so it had been quite foggy on the water and my solar panels couldn't really recharge the battery, but I still need to make water. So one day I made the water and I still had 80%, 85% of battery, but I woke up in the middle of the night completely in the dark. Everything, my GPS turned off. So that, that was really stressful because I tried to turn on the light, nothing, mm -hmm. it's dark. And then you're like, okay, if I don't see other boats, they don't see me. Like, what if there's a container coming? I can't sleep. I've got to go outside, but the weather is bad. I can't really go outside now. I mean, I'm naked. I'm in underwear. What do I do? It was so stressful. But then it's funny. You get used to it. Yeah. You get used to it. Yeah. yeah. What, kind, what kind of experience did, did you have then? Being alert is one thing, but did you ever come into contact with wildlife, whales, sharks, birds, boats? On the way? Oh yeah, that was that was probably the most beautiful thing. Yeah. You know, it's it's like National Geographic yeah. out there. I was so slow. I go two miles an hour. <laughs> uh, so when I left the coast, uh, Monterey is, is about three hours south of San Francisco. It's a bay, and it's uh, it's got a, a topography underwater that is really very good for wildlife. So there's a lot of fish and that are growing there. So whales are a lot, and there's a lot of whales. So I could see maybe whales the first two weeks and then dolphins and then the birds. I could start to see some albatross, which I love this bird. And then throughout the journey, some species go away, some other arrives. Maybe there's tuna that arrive. And then you could see mahi-mahi, which is yeah. uh, another of these different kinds. And then you start to see the flying fish yeah. when the water starts to warm up a little bit. And the flying fish, but 200 flying fish, like, do, 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 do. what? Fantastic. And then you see birds that are trying to catch the flying fish, the frigate birds. So I saw birds the whole way, the whole, every day, even though if you don't see land for three months, I could see birds every day. And that's where you, you recognize like this, this wildlife is so well adapted to these conditions. And they are amazing. They fly day and night in storm and flat weather. Like, how the heck do they do that? And then you become to create this respect for their, for them. And then how you feel bad at seeing all this plastic, you know. I mean, there, there is something in that, you know, post-adventure blues, isn't there? There's that kind of reflection, sense of achievement, but it's like, what's next? <laughs> what's next? Yeah. Well, it, it did happen to me. And it's, like you said, it's quite known, the post-expedition distress syndrome. Or, and and it's like a baby blues, you know, it's it's quite un difficult to understand. Like, yeah. like the women have a baby, why should be... They, you know, should they be sad? Uh, and and for us, I think it's uh, uh, I think it's it's a change of pace uh, by being completely free on the ocean and a very simple life where you do the same thing every day and then you're on your own. There's no stress. Going back to the stressful life of you know emails and phone numbers, yeah. and <laughs> phone calls and calendars yeah. and social media and, and press and but also the uh, the. The hard for me, it didn't like very long, maybe just a few days, where I felt so emotional uh, having lived what I lived. I wanted to share it. But then I quickly realized that whoever I was going to share it with could not really grasp, grasp what it meant. Like when I say, you know, the connection I had with, with the waves and the, like... Yeah. They can't understand because they haven't been there, you know, and, and it's okay. And, and after a while, you just understand that... You know, they don't mean not to understand. It's just that they haven't been there. So I guess I felt a lot of relief when I spoke with another adventure man that had yeah. done something similar. I say, you know that? I get it. Yeah. And then you know he gets it. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. F fantastic, Cyril. It's, it's some achievement. It, it, it really it really is. It's, it's phenomenal. 
So the the Atlantic, that's next. Mm-hmm. So California to Hawaii, what was it? Twenty was it no sorry, was it two thousand miles or just more than two thousand miles? Yeah, it's twenty uh, twenty four hundred. Yeah, twenty four hundred uh, nautical miles. Um <laughs> Um, and it's a hard one because the, oh, here's the thing: the Pacific, mid Pacific, you leave from the mainland, mm-hmm. right? You leave from California, and you tra- you're finishing an island. The hard part is to get to the trade winds. You need to have the winds and the current favorable to do that kind of adventure, because otherwise you can't go against the current. Yeah. Now the Atlantic is actually considered a little. It's a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. It's going to be twenty six hundred nautical miles, but Starting from an island to arrive at an island, the trade winds are a little bit more established. Mm-hmm. So if I pick the right time to leave, then it should, should be actually more favorable. In fact, I think it's going to take less time. And my estimation is about 75 days, but yeah, okay. I was very wrong on my first crossing. <laughs> I thought it was going to be 70 days. I did 90. Mm-hmm. So I'll have food for 80 days and I can ration again if I need to. Uh but yeah, I'm very much looking forward to going back on the ocean. Yeah, it's calling me again. Yeah, and it's from the Canary Islands, isn't it? What, which which one of the Canaries are you leaving from? Um, I'm going to be in the the an island called El Hierro, which is west. It's the furthest west. So there's first I have to bring the the the, the kayak to Cadiz, mm-hmm. which is the south of Spain, and then take a ferry to Tenerife. And then from Tenerife, I have to go to El Hierro. Mm-hmm. And, and El Hierro, I will go west. Um, so it still is the North Atlantic, but it's the east to west. And I'm going west all the way to Barbados. Yeah. And at first, I wanted to start and finish, well, finish in a French island. You know, Guadeloupe or Martinique would be great because there's a lot of rum over there. So it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but then I spoke to a, a friend who's a, a sailor and says, you know, as soon as you get into the, the islands, the, the currents are, are shifting and there's a different mm-hmm. dynamic with the currents. The depth are changing. So it could be chaotic in some islands. And also the wind is shifting. So usually for, for a vessel like mine, uh, stopping at the first island, which is Barbados, yeah. is, is usually the easiest to land. So I'm doing east to west, the North Atlantic. I'm above the, the equator line. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's December 2024. Yeah. <clears throat> Everything on track for that currently? Yes, currently, right now, I'm uh, refurbishing everything I can on my own, uh, you know, doing a little bit of uh, MacGyver kind of yeah. action here, uh, and uh, really, uh, you know, hunting for sponsors. Yeah. Um, you know, my budget uh, entails you know, refurbishing the boat, uh, sending the boat to uh, Canary Islands, and staying there for two weeks, preparing the boat uh, with my uh, part of my crew, uh, and then, you know, bring the boat back from Barbados. and. And then I'm going to be four months with no revenue, but I still have to pay for a mortgage. So I have to pay for <laughs> yeah. life, you know? So part of it is I'm not really trying to make any money and I don't want to be the, you know, just full time. I just need not to lose money. Yeah. <laughs> so Definitely. now sponsors that are, you know, I do speaking engage- engagement yeah. uh, where I talk about my whole adventure and that helps me finance the, the next adventure. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's companies that really believe that there's values in my crossing that um, they really connect with, and that they want their employees to be connected with. So um, I'm, it's it's going well. Uh, I still have six months. I want to close the budget in six months, but it's a, it's in a good path. Excellent, excellent. Well, we'll see what we can do about raising more awareness of it through some of these channels. And, and I mean, I'm uh, in contact with some expos and, and things as well, so I'll, I'll make sure that people are aware of the episodes and everything that's going along with it to see see how much more exposure we can get. Cause, uh, oh, thank you so much. Yeah. <clears throat> I actually love it. I love yeah. to share the adventure because that's, um, I, I feel, I feel the, how I think, you know, you're always looking for what's my purpose in life. What's my talent? Like, why am I put, why, why was I put on earth in the first place? And what would make my life worth living? And yeah. I think for me, uh, it's it's just living these crazy adventures and sharing it and trying to inspire people to to live their best lives. So when I speak to a school or you know like, like here in California, maybe a month ago, I went to nine hundred kids, nine hundred yeah. kids from twelve to fourteen. Imagine if I just put a little seed of adventure in their heart at fourteen, 
what they will do in 10 years. Yes. I love this. Yeah. I'll do it for Amazing. free. Amazing. You know, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> that's, and that's partly why the reason I, I reached out. And, and that's part, I mean, that is a massive part of why I'm doing this show. Really, it's, it's just to, you know, just make a, anything that just anyone can take away. It, you mean, it doesn't need to be rowing or sailing or, you know, kayaking the Atlantic or the, the Pacific. I love it's, it. it's just get the little seed, the little nugget and go and do something that's relative to, to your conditions or your environment or whatever it may be. Uh, and I think listening to some of your stuff talking about the trials and tribulations a little bit, you know, having a, a kind of, you know, an aborted journey, but, you know, what lessons did you learn from that mentally, physically, and then going again? It's just, it's these types of things. You can, mm -hmm. I mean, that carries forward into any, you know, any industry or work or career or adventure. Or it's, yeah. it's, it's it's fantastic. It really is. You're, a, you're an inspiration, mm -hmm. Cyril, and... Uh, I, I want to do a long distance kayak or canoe journey, and, and I've got the Amazon as a as a, a thing in, in my, that I want to build up to. Uh, I'm not going to put my neck on the line just yet, so because I think my wife and my oh. family will go mad. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but that's but. well, I had to, I had the plan to do it as well at some point, and I've got a friend. His name is West Henson. Mm -hmm. He's kayaked the entire length of the Amazon from source to sea, and uh, spoke to him. Uh, he just finished the Northwest Passage now with, uh, I think with a fellow Scottish guy. Uh, uh -huh. uh, and like last week they arrived and they crossed the whole Northwest patch Passage in one season uh -huh. uh, without, you know, pulling and being on ice, just kayaking on their own human powered. And West was telling me, you know what, that the Amazon was amazing, but it still is dangerous. Yeah. There's There's been accounts of people being kidnapped and there's the drugs and, yeah. and traffic and gun traffic. So, um, for me, it's adventure, yeah. so maybe one day I'll be able to do it, yeah. and maybe we'll do it together, yeah, my brother. Yeah, I'd love to have a paddle. I'd love to have a paddle <laughs> with you. I, I, I tell you what, why don't you paddle from the, the eastern seaboard and arrive in Oban in Scotland, and I'll come back with you over to the to the <laughs> Yes, <laughs> be careful. I don't need more items in my bucket list, <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, excellent, <laughs> phenomenal. Thank you. So, so uh, you know, what be a bit respectful of your your time, Cyril. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. I, I think people are going to get a lot, a lot out of this episode. It's been very motivational, very inspiring. So, we have two closing traditions on the show. One of which is a call to adventure, uh, and the other one is a pay it forward segment. So, the the call to adventure is a is an opportunity for for you, the, the guest, to to give us a suggestion to get people, like you say, disconnected out into nature doing something small, micro or, or macro, what, what, what would mm -hmm. your call to adventure be? Well, I would start by looking at the definition of adventure. If I ask you what's adventure, you're going to say it's excitement. It's a new thing. It's spontaneity. It's, um, uh, you know, just fun, right? Adventure is fun. And if you look at the opposite of adventure, Something that is not adventurous, what would you say? It's routine, it's normal, it's it's boring. Like, why wouldn't you want to have adventure? Like, it's per definition, you want an adventurous life, right? So then look at what could be an adventure for you, right? I like to kayak, I do kayak, but maybe I'm going to hurt my wrist and I'm going to do something else. I'm going to cross Argentina with a camel or bring a, a sheep in across Mongolia. I don't care about Whatever, what drives me is that, what drives you. And I think it, it also, if you're looking for adventure, you're looking for happiness, right? But sometimes we're looking for happiness in our lives with the wrong thing. Like what is going to bring me happiness? Is it maybe a big, big job or responsibility, a bigger house, another car, blah, blah, blah. No, no. I think we should look for vibration. And what's vibration is remember the last thing where you felt so good and Maybe having friends around. Maybe it's going and 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 doing that two-hour bike ride. Maybe it's going on a trip overseas. Maybe it's learning a new skill. So if you look for vibration and you look for adventure, whatever you want to do is good. It has to come from the heart. It has to come from like that that inner fire that you want to do and do it again. You do it for free, right? And then and it could be about taking photograph 
of butterflies around the world. Mm-hmm. I don't care. You want to start guitar? Start now. I started cacking. I was 32. You, you want to do what? Uh, see all the biggest trees in the world? Do that. You want to do, uh, you know, help people um, learning how to speak Spanish? Do that. Whatever it is, like it's adventure, it's vibration. Do that. Excellent. I love your passion. It's never too late. It's ne- it's never it, it just, you know, whatever, whatever. Yeah. Just get on with it. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And finally, a pay it forward suggestion. Ah, uh, paid forward. Uh, wait, what's your, your, your definition so, of, of paid forward? Yeah. So this is for a worthy cause, a charity, a project, you know, something, okay. something to spread awareness for good causes. It could be, you know, ocean, okay. uh, related or, or not. Okay. So I'm going to do something ocean related, something that's passionate. And I spoke about it, about the pollution on the ocean. Mm-hmm. Now I want to offer perspective. Obviously most of your listeners that love nature know that you don't have to throw paper or plastic when you're at the beach or something. Right. But I think what we have to change is if you go on the beach and you see something on the floor, if you don't pick it up, it's as bad as if you had thrown it yourself, which is not right. You didn't do it, but like caring, caring for that. Like if everybody, like if I do it myself, yeah, it's going to change. If you do it and somebody else does it. But if everybody had this mentality where I'm going to clean wherever I go, if, if I leave it better than I found it. It's an improvement. And and the power is in multiplying that. Right. So maybe just a little message of yeah, yeah, pick it up. Yeah. Le- leave no trace. Even if it's someone mm-hmm. else's, leave no trace. Pick it up. Mm-hmm. Do your bit. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Cyril. This has been a, an incredible conversation. I love your energy. I love your passion. I, I love everything that you've done, really. And, and I really mm. appreciate you taking the time to, to chat to us today. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Chris. Thanks to everyone listening. And they want to follow the, the journey of the Atlantic. It's uh, solo, kayaktheatlantic.com. And uh, I hope to meet every one of you and, and share the passion of adventure in life. Yeah, likewise. And hopefully we can do a follow-up and we can talk about your success across the Atlantic as well. Oh, uh, 100%. And the next one. And, and the, the next, next one. one. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the one to Scotland and back. And maybe the Amazon <laughs> time as well. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. For the show notes and further information, please visit adventurediaries.com slash podcast. And finally, we hope to have inspired you to take action and plan your next adventure, big or small, because sometimes we all need a little adventure to cleanse that bitter taste of life from the soul. Until next time, have fun and keep paying it forward.